In the 21st century, we live in a complex and fast-changing world. The experience of each new generation differs radically from that of the previous one. For example, in the generation of my parents, nobody had a computer or a cell phone, but today, virtually everyone has these things. Ask yourself, how many things you use your computer and your cell phone for, and how much time you spend with them, and you'll get some insight into how different your life is from that of the earlier generation. In the past, radical changes of this sort took place over centuries. Now, they occur in only a few years. These constant changes over time make people feel uneasy or insecure. Certain practices or traditional things that people have done all their lives suddenly become obsolete. This leads to an experience of disorientation and alienation with modern life. Everything stable seems to slip away and there seems to be nothing fixed to hold on to. This is the situation that we face in the 21st century. The Danish philosopher and religious thinker Soren Kierkegaard saw these changes taking place in the 19th century. While Kierkegaard never heard of the internet, the iPad, or the digital camera, nonetheless, he had great insight into modernity. Today, we can read his works, and they can help us to understand the world around us and our place in it. Hello and welcome, wherever you may be around the world in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, the Americas, or Europe, welcome to the course, Soren Kierkegaard, Subjectivity, Irony, and the Crisis of Modernity. My name is John Stewart, and I'm a scholar at the Soren Kierkegaard Research Center at the Faculty of Theology from the University of Copenhagen. In this course, we'll examine the thought of Soren Kierkegaard, a unique figure who has inspired, provoked, fascinated, and irritated people ever since he walked the streets of Copenhagen. We'll follow in Kierkegaard's footsteps and see the actual places where he lived and wrote his famous works. Today, scholars argue about whether Kierkegaard was a philosopher, a theologian, an inspirational writer, a literary author, a psychologist, or something else altogether. In the end, he was a little bit of all these things, and his highly creative form of writing makes it difficult to say exactly what genre he was using or what academic field he belonged to. This feature of his writing is reflected in the complex history of the reception of his thought. His works have been enormously influential for a number of different fields, for example, philosophy, theology, religious studies, literary theory, aesthetics, and psychology. That a single thinker can appeal to people in so many different disciplines is interesting in itself, but the truly odd thing about this reception is that he has had an appeal to people who radically disagree among each other and thus represent conflicting positions. He's been seen as an advocate of both progressive political views and reactionary ones. He's been celebrated as both an existentialist and an essentialist. He's been hailed as both a critic of German idealism and a follower of it. One explanation for this odd aspect of his reception is that there's something undetermined or open-ended about Kierkegaard's writings that allows him, in a sense, to speak to everyone. And in his works, rich and diverse as they are, one can always seem to find something special that gives one special insight into one's own life and situation. I hope that all of you around the world will find this to be true as you begin to read the text for this course. I hope that you will find in his text something that speaks to you personally. In this class, we'll explore how Kierkegaard deals with the problems associated with relativism, the lack of meaning, and the crisis of religious faith that are typical of modern life. In his famous work, The Concept of Irony, from 1841, Kierkegaard examines different forms of subjectivism and relativism as they're conceived as criticisms of traditional culture. What do we mean by these terms, subjectivism and relativism? We say, for example, that a certain law or custom is merely relative in the sense that it is only accepted in one culture or society, but rejected in others. When we make statements of this sort, they're usually critical and intended to undermine the validity of the law or custom at issue. In other words, if something is merely relative, then it doesn't have absolute validity or authority, and therefore we can choose to follow it or not. This is the way that we're used to talking about things like relativism and subjectivism.
Kuhut refers to these different tendencies under the heading irony. Why does he use this term? Sometimes when people today say that something is ironic, they mean that it was an unfortunate or fateful event. For example, in the sense that one might say that when a bad thing happened to a bad person, that this is ironic. But this isn't what Kihord means. Instead, when we're ironic about something, we say the opposite of what we really mean, and the context alerts the listener to this. For example, here in Copenhagen, when we're having bad weather with violent rain or heavy snow, I might say, it's wonderful weather that we're having. Since the person addressed knows that the weather at the moment is in fact very poor, they immediately know that I don't literally mean what I'm saying, but rather that I'm being ironic. This is the way irony is commonly used. But irony can also be used in a critical manner. For example, in politics, if I disagree with a specific policy or a proposed law, I might say, that's a great policy, or that's a great law, thereby meaning exactly the opposite. It's this critical sense of irony that is the kind of thing that Kjord has in mind when he associates it with subjectivism and relativism. With this kind of irony, one can criticize accepted customs and practices, and indeed, absolutely anything at all. In the concept of irony, Kjord compares irony in the form used by the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates with modern irony, which is represented by the German Romantics in his own day. In both cases, an attempt is made to use critical reflection to call into question traditional beliefs and ways of thinking. While Kierhard is critical of the Romantics, he has great praise for Socrates. Indeed, he takes Socrates as his model in his attempt to criticize his own Danish culture and its conception of religion in the 19th century. By contrast, the Romantics are seen to represent a typical modern kind of problem that we just mentioned, subjectivism, relativism, nihilism, alienation, lack of meaning, and so forth. As the modern movements of existentialism, post-structuralism, and postmodernism reveal, the issues that Kjord addressed are still among the central problems of philosophy today. At the end of his life, Kierkegaard, looking back on his work, wrote that his task was a Socratic task. Moreover, he says, quote, the only analogy I have before me is Socrates. What did he mean by this? He seems to have taken Socrates, or we could say his, his own version of Socrates, as his personal model in his own life. In his writings, he took himself to be doing something like what Socrates was doing with his philosophy. So, in order to understand what Kierkegaard meant by this, we first need to see how he understood Socrates and what he took Socrates to stand for. Once we've identified the key elements of Kierkegaard's understanding of the character and philosophy of Socrates, then we can try to see how he tried to make use of these in his own work. The obvious place to start with this is with Kierkegaard's book, The Concept of Irony which contains his most detailed explanation of the figure of Socrates. In this first lecture, we want to make a start at this. Today, we'll first look at Kierkegaard's early life, his family background and his education at the School of Civic Virtue here in Copenhagen. We'll then turn to the concept of irony and try to understand its structure and argumentative strategy. Finally, we'll have a look at a couple of Plato's dialogues, the Euthyphro and the Apology, in which we'll see some of the key elements of Socrates' philosophy portrayed. Specifically, we'll have a look at the following themes. Socrates' irony, Socrates' ability to reduce his dialogue partner to what's called aporia, or being at a loss, Socrates' relation to the sophists, Socrates' self-understanding as the gadfly of Athens, Socrates' daimon or personal spirit, and finally, Socrates' art of midwifery or maiotics. Our goal here is to understand these ideas in the original context of Socrates' thought as portrayed by Plato. Then we'll go on to see how Kihort understands them and appropriates them for his own purposes. Soren Kierkegaard was born here in Copenhagen on May the 5th, 1813. He came into the world on a, in a house that stood here in Newtor, 
Unfortunately, the house was destroyed in 1908, but we can see it portrayed in pictures from the period. The building stood next door to the dominant structure on the square, the courthouse, with the large neoclassical columns. Kjord lived during the rich period in Danish cultural life that's usually referred to as the Danish Golden Age. This was the period when people such as the fairy tale author Hans Christian Andersen and the physicist Hans Christian Ørsted flourished. Copenhagen was a relatively small town at the time, and all these figures knew each other and mutually enriched each other's work. For example, Kjord's first book, From the Papers of One Still Living, was published in 1838 and was the criticism of a novel by Hans Christian Andersen. Although this was a rich cultural period in Denmark with regard to economics, at the time of Kjord's birth, Copenhagen was a poor city in an, in an impoverished country. In the year when he was born, the Danish state had gone bankrupt. There were only a few people who could preserve their property in these difficult times. Kjord's father, a man named Michael Peterson Kjord, was one of these few. He bought a house on Neutor in 1809, a couple of years before Kjord's birth. Michael Peterson Kjord was born into a very poor family. He came from Jutland to Copenhagen when he was 12 years old. In Copenhagen, he became an apprentice in a wool business of his own, uh, uncle's. Uh, and after about 10 years, he became independent and had his own business. He was extremely successful and in time became rich. Kjord's mother, Anna Sorensetter Lund, was the father's second wife. She was the maidservant in the father's house uh, and they married 13 months after the death of his father's first wife. Kjord's father was a profoundly religious man and Kjord was raised in the tradition of Lutheran Christianity. This stamped the character of Kjord and his elder brother Peter Christian Kjord, who went on to study theology and became a leading pastor and later bishop in the Danish church. When Kjord was a boy, his nickname around the house was the Fork. The reason for this was that one day, when he was asked what he wanted to be when he grew up, he replied, a fork. When asked why a fork, he responded, then I could spear anything I wanted on the dinner table. When he was then asked, but what if we were to come after you, he replied, then I'll spear you. This story evidences the fact that the young Kjord was a provocative lad who enjoyed getting the better of people. So when Kjord was the youngest of seven children, all of Kjord's brothers and sisters died at a fairly young age, with the sole exception of his elder brother, Peter Christian. The early deaths of his siblings caused a shadow of melancholy to hover over the Kjord home. By 1834, when Kjord was just 21 years old, only he, his brother Peter Christian, and his father remained. All of the others, five brothers and sisters, and his mother were dead. This is the school where Kjord first learned Latin and Greek and developed his interest in the classics. The School of Civic Virtue was founded in 1789 as a school for the sons of wealthy bourgeois families. Kjord attended the school from 1821 to 1830 when he was admitted to the University of Copenhagen. The school was an intensive one that focused on classical education in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. It was here that Kjord learned ancient Greek and developed a love for Greek culture and literature. During his time at the school, he studied in Greek Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and some of Herodotus' histories and some of the New Testament. Most importantly, he also read some of the dialogues of the Greek philosopher Plato, specifically the Euthyphro, the Apology, and the Credo. He also read another important source of the life and teachings of Socrates, namely Xenophon's memorabilia of Socrates. It was presumably here that Kjord first made the acquaintance of the figure of Socrates who would fascinate him for the rest of his life. But looking back at his time at the school, Kjord probably didn't have so many fond memories. By all accounts, he didn't have many friends which was probably due to the fact that he had a tendency to tease and antagonize his fellow students with his superior intellect. He enjoyed demonstrating his cleverness by soundly refuting the arguments of his classmates and making them look silly. Unfortunately, since he wasn't the largest boy in the class, his provocations had the negative consequence that he occasionally was beaten by others uh, for the humiliation that they had suffered at his hands. In any case, these negative experiences didn't prevent him from returning to the school later in life to teach Latin. <laughs> 
Kierhard's book, The Concept of Irony, is divided into two large parts. Part one is entitled, The Position of Socrates Viewed as Irony. In this part, he compares the picture of Socrates that's presented by the three main ancient sources, Plato, Xenophon, and Aristophanes. As we know, Plato and Xenophon were both students of Socrates, who wrote dialogues in which they pre presented the beloved teacher as the main speaker. Aristophanes, by contrast, parodied Socrates in a humorous manner in the comedy The Clouds. The view that Kierhard consistently urges throughout his analysis is that Socrates doesn't have any philosophical doctrine or theory, but rather he merely contradicts or refutes what others say without presenting anything positive in his own name. In this sense, Socrates represents a negative, destructive force. Kierhard doesn't mean that Socrates is negative in the sense that we mean today when we talk of someone, for example, having a negative disposition, that is, someone who's pessimistic. Rather, Socrates is negative in the sense that he refuses to present a positive thesis or doctrine with concrete positive content. His undertaking is negative insofar as it's designed to undermine the position of others. In the first part of the work, Kierkegaard wants to establish that this interpretation of Socrates is, in fact, well grounded in the ancient sources themselves. This first part of the work is followed by an appendix called Hegel's View of Socrates. This refer refers to the treatment of Socrates by the German philosopher Hegel in his lectures. Hegel's interpretation of Socrates and his role in the development of philosophy and culture was profoundly influential at the time. Kierkegaard knew this and made a careful study of Hegel's different accounts of Socrates, which he critically built on in the concept of irony. So in order to understand Kierkegaard's picture of Socrates, we also have to have some insight into Hegel's interpretation and Kierkegaard's response to it. This will be the subject of the second video lecture. Part two of Kierkegaard's work is simply entitled The Concept of Irony. It's here that Kierkegaard treats the modern form of irony in the German Romantics. While Socratic irony was given a generally positive treatment, the Romantics are criticized is using irony in the service of relativism or nihilism. Their goal is simply to undermine bourgeois society, but there's no truth or deeper meaning that they wish to propose to replace it. The final short section of the work is entitled, Irony as a Controlled Element, the Truth of Irony. This section has been quite controversial in the secondary literature. It seems to be Kierkegaard's presentation of his own view of the proper and appropriate use of irony. Clearly, it's impossible to go back to ancient Athens and use irony in the same way that Socrates did, since the historical and cultural background has changed so radically since his time. Romantic irony is likewise no alternative, given Kierkegaard's criticism of that in the pages that precede this section. So instead, he suggests a limited form of irony, which he believes is the most appropriate in his own day. The central focus of attention in most of the concept of irony is, without a doubt, Socrates. But it was not just in the concept of irony that Kierkegaard examined the teachings of this philosopher. Rather, he was fascinated with the figure of Socrates, whom he returned to throughout his life. What was it about the ancient Greek philosopher that interested Kierkegaard, and what's meant by Socratic irony? Socrates lived in ancient Athens in the 5th century BC and his work has been recorded in the form of dialogues by a student Plato. In 399 BC, Socrates was brought up on charges by his fellow Athenians and sentenced to death. The dialogue The Apology is an account of his trial, and the dialogue The Phaedo is an account of his final hours and his execution by drinking hemlock. Socrates spent much of his time walking around the city and talking with people. He went to people who claimed to know something about some specific area and asked them about it. Claiming to be ignorant, 
He begged his discussion partners to enlighten him on whatever topic they claimed to know something about. Thus, he would begin a dialogue with them. What's known as Socratic irony usually appears at the beginning of these exchanges, when Socrates gets his interlocutor to explain something to him or to give a definition of something. One can see this illustrated in the dialogue The Euthyphro. In this work, Socrates goes to the courthouse at Athens to stand trial for the charges raised against him. There, he meets an acquaintance, Euthyphro. The two greet and ask each other what business they have at court. To Socrates' astonishment, Euthyphro explains that he's bringing charges against his own father. Needless to say, this is something very unusual, especially in ancient Greece where respect for one's father was a highly cherished and time-honored value. Socrates can immediately see the obvious contradiction between the love and respect that one owes one's father and Euthyphro's action. But instead of pointing out this contradiction, he pretends to assume that there must be something that he has not understood and that Euthyphro must have some special knowledge into this matter. Socrates explains, quote, Good heavens, of course most people have no idea, Euthyphro, what the rights of such a case are. I imagine that it isn't everyone who may take such a course of action, but only one who is far advanced in wisdom. This sounds like a compliment in the ears of Euthyphro, who fails to see the irony in it. And so he responds self-confidently, far indeed, Socrates. Euthyphro goes on to assure Socrates that he is in fact an expert in such things, and Socrates seems to assent to this. One can also see Socrates' irony at the end of the dialogue, when Euthyphro grows tired of Socrates' refuting every answer that he gives, and suddenly runs off. Pretending to have an urgent appointment, as Euthyphro hastens away, Socrates feigns a great disappointment, since he thought that he was going to learn something about piety from Euthyphro. Socrates seems almost to heckle Euthyphro, saying that without his instruction, he's condemned to live in the ignorance of his own views for the rest of his life. By claiming not to know anything himself, and by getting Euthyphro to boast about having expert knowledge, Socrates is free to ask Euthyphro questions, pretending to want to learn from him. Euthyphro would look silly if, after having claimed to be an expert, he refused to answer him. Maybe you happen to know someone like Euthyphro, someone who claims to be a big expert about something, but really who doesn't know very much, although they're very proud of their knowledge. What Socrates realized was that it was easy to get people like this talking when one flattered them for their expertise. So in this way, the Socratic dialogue is initiated. Socrates' irony is a key factor in this process. At first glance, he seems to be ironic first about not knowing anything, since clearly the ensuing discussion demonstrates that he in fact knows something about the topic, and second, about granting that Euthyphro does know something or is an expert. Kierkegaard was fascinated by this since he saw in his own Danish society of the 19th century people like Euthyphro who claimed to have knowledge about things about which they were in fact ignorant. He was intrigued by Socrates' use of irony to bait these people so that they would fail once they began to explain what they thought that they had understood. In addition to irony, another important element of the Socratic dialogue for Kierkegaard is what is known as aporia. This is a Greek word which means simply being at a loss or being unable to answer. Socrates brings Euthyphro and his other interlocutors to a state of aporia in the course of the dialogue. Socrates asks Euthyphro for a definition of piety, which Euthyphro gives. But then, upon Socrates' cross-examination, they both agree that this is not satisfactory. And so Socrates asks for a better definition. The same thing happens with the second definition, the third, and so on, so that in the end, no real definition or result is achieved. Losing patience with Socrates and seeing that he's beginning to look more and more foolish, Euthyphro suddenly claims that he has an urgent uh, appointment and he runs off. Thus the dialogue itself ends in aporia since no definition of piety is ever agreed to. <laughs>
For this reason, it is said that this is one of Plato's aporetic dialogues, that is, one of the dialogues that ends with no definitive conclusion to the question under examination. Now, usually, when one writes a philosophical treatise or tract, the goal is to demonstrate a specific thesis, to establish a specific point. The procedure of Socrates is, in this regard, very unusual, since it doesn't establish anything at all. Rather, the result is purely negative. All that the reader has learned is that a handful of definitions of piety that have been proposed are incorrect. But the reader still doesn't know what piety is. No positive definition has survived the process of critical examination. This procedure appealed to Kihord very much, and he enjoyed seeing in Socrates a thinker of negativity in this sense. Socrates' goal was not to establish a positive doctrine, but merely to call into question what he saw before himself. He wanted to get others to reconsider their long-held views by pointing out that they rested on uncertain foundations. Five years after the concept of irony, Kihord returns to this feature of Socrates' philosophizing in his journal J.J. Quote, the fact that several of Plato's dialogues end without result has a far deeper reason than I had earlier thought. It makes the reader or listener self-active. Kihord was fascinated by the fact that although Socrates was only doing something negative, he nonetheless made other people reflective and reconsider certain aspects of their beliefs and lives. In the 5th century BC, there were in Athens at the time a number of traveling scholars of rhetoric who would give lessons to the sons of rich families for a fee. These figures were known as the sophists. They claimed to be able to teach useful skills such as public speaking, logical reasoning, and argumentation, along with providing general knowledge of the different fields. Like some lawyers today, these figures had a somewhat shady reputation at the time for being able to twist words and to win cases for implausible or even wrongful positions. They were eloquent speakers who could seduce people with language. They were interested not so much in the truth as in winning the argument. Since Socrates was often seen in the streets, apparently giving instruction to young men, he was associated with the sophists by many of the people of Athens, and thus one of the charges leveled against him is that he makes the weaker argument the stronger, since this is what the sophists were known to do. But Socrates vehemently rejects this association. He points out that unlike the sophists, he doesn't claim to know anything, and thus doesn't teach anything. The young men come to listen to his discussion simply because they find it amusing to see him interrogate people in his own special way. Since Socrates doesn't teach anything, he never demands any kind of fee, in contrast to the sophists who live from the fees that they receive for their instruction. Kihord was attentive to Socrates' polemic with the sophists, which is portrayed in many of the dialogues of Plato. He saw many people in the Copenhagen of his own day whom he regarded as modern versions of the sophists. They claimed to know something about Christianity and to teach this while benefiting materially from their positions in the church. While they enjoyed a comfortable life with financial security, they taught a version of Christianity that Kierkegaard found to be deeply problematic. Kierkegaard was thus inspired by Socrates' method to try to undermine these self-satisfied and overly competent, overly confident people. Socrates' procedure of questioning people irritated a number of his fellow citizens who felt publicly humiliated, especially when Socrates would refute them in front of a crowd of bemused young men. So some of his enemies raised charges against him and he was forced to defend himself in a trial. But when asked to explain why he goes around Athens and harasses his fellow citizens in this way, Socrates tells the story of a friend of his who went to the oracle at Delphi. In ancient Greek society, the oracle 
was a revered religious institution. It was believed that the god Apollo spoke through the priestesses there. Whenever some important decision needed to be made, either about some private matter or about some larger matter of the state, it would be typical that one would go to the oracle in order to ask the god if the proposed plan would prosper. Socrates' friend asked the god if there was anyone who was wiser than Socrates, and the god replied through the priestess that, in fact, there was no one. When his friend reported this, Socrates was perplexed by the answer since he couldn't think of anything that he had any special knowledge about. Indeed, he saw many people around him whom he considered to be much wiser than he about a number of different things. And so he set out to ask these different people about what they knew. As it turned out, he went around from one person to the next each of them pretended, like Euthyphro, to be a great expert at something, but in the end, after Socrates' questioning, they proved to know nothing at all. Socrates was then led to the conclusion that he was wiser in the sense that he at least knew that he did not know, in contrast to others who claimed to know things that they did not know. This, he thought, must be the meaning of the oracle. Socrates' knowledge was not some positive knowledge about some concrete sphere of thought or activity, but rather a negative knowledge. Paradoxically, Socrates' knowledge is that he does not know anything at all. So Socrates came to believe that he had been given a divine mission and that it was his religious duty to go around Athens and to test people's claims to knowledge. This was his explanation to the jurors for why he acted the way he did. Socrates uses the image of a gadfly as an analogy to his action. A gadfly goes around and irritates a horse by constantly buzzing around and landing here and there on it. Socrates sees himself as doing the same thing with his fellow Athenians. He explains, quote, I think the God attached me to the city the sort of person who never ceases provoking you and persuading you and reproaching each and every one of you the whole day long, everywhere I settle. Socrates thus portrays himself as the gadfly of Athens, who performs a beneficial, although irritating, function of keeping people from falling into complacency and constantly keeping them on their guard with respect to their claims to knowledge. Socrates thus regards his work as a religious calling, He's not interrogating people on the streets because he likes to do so, or because he personally might think it's a good idea, but rather he sees himself as following the command of the God. It's his religious duty to do so. This was the image that Kihord relished, and he came to conceive of his own task as like that of Socrates. He believed that through his writings, he could, in effect, be the gadfly of Copenhagen, keeping his fellow countrymen from falling into complacency. One of the charges that was raised against Socrates was that he worshipped foreign gods that were not worshipped in Athens. This charge refers to what Socrates called his daimon. This is a Greek word that means literally a god or a spirit. In many of the Platonic dialogues, mention is made of Socrates' daimon as a kind of personal spirit or inner voice that advises him. Modern scholars have had difficulties making sense of this. Some try to interpret it as the voice of conscience, while others regard it as a form of superstition, something like a guardian angel. In his trial, Socrates explains the daimon as follows. Something divine and spiritual comes to me. This has been coming to me as a kind of voice beginning in childhood, and whenever it comes, it always diverts me from what I'm about to do, but never urges me on. So Socrates claims that he has a private inner voice that prevents him from getting into trouble by telling him not to do something that is ill-considered. But the daimon never offers him any positive suggestions for what he should do. The daimon is purely negative. Socrates believes this also to be a part of his divine mission, or to be a part of the divine will. When the jurors convict him of the charges and sentence him to death, he claims that he's not concerned about this, since throughout the entire trial, his daimon never once raised an objection or anything 
uh, against anything he was saying or doing, a fact which Socrates takes to mean that everything is proceeding according to the divine will. Therefore, he concludes that he has nothing to fear. This was also an idea that Kierhardt identified with in his work, The Point of View for My Work as an Author, in which he reflects on his life and his writing career. He explains his conviction that his life has been driven by an invisible divine governance. God had a plan for his life, which Kihord unwittingly realized. God was, in a sense, guiding Kihord in his writings in the same way that Socrates' daimon was guiding him. Another feature of Socrates' thought is what is referred to as maiotics, or the art of midwifery. The word maiotics simply comes from the Greek adjective maiotikos, meaning of or about midwifery. Socrates explains that his mother was a midwife and that he took this art from her. When he questions people, the goal, he claims, is to get them to come to the truth for themselves. The idea is that they implicitly have the truth within themselves, but without knowing this consciously. But this knowledge can be brought to light with the kind of leading questioning that Socrates engages in. A famous example of this is when Socrates questions an uneducated slave boy in the dialogue the Mino, and merely by questioning, without stating anything positive himself, he's able to lead the boy to an understanding of some of the basic principles of geometry. Everyone present is astonished that the boy apparently knew geometry ahead of time without ever having any instruction in it. This is consistent with Socrates' repeated claim that he doesn't teach anything. He claims merely to be a midwife who assists in the birth of ideas, but himself doesn't produce them. He simply helps others to produce them and to evaluate them subsequently. The ideas lie hidden in the individuals themselves without them even being aware of them. This later leads Socrates to a doctrine of innate ideas, that is, the notion that we're born with certain ideas right from the start, and that we know things before actually having any experience of the world. Socrates' maiutics is a motif that Kierhard also uses in his writings. He doesn't want to state explicitly what he thinks Christianity is, but by means of his writings, he wants to help others to arrive at their own conception of it. I'm glad to have with me today Professor Peter Scheude from the Slovak Academy of Science in Bratislava. Professor Scheude is a leading international expert in the field of Kihord studies and has done substantial work on Kihord's relation to mysticism and the reception of Kihord's thought in the 20th century. Uh, Professor Scheude, uh, why do you think that uh, Kihord makes use of Socrates, a pagan philosopher, in order to illustrate the, the problems of Christianity, or Christendom in his own day. Kierkegaard says sometimes um, that his uh, philosophy revolves around a um, simple question. And the question is, um, what does it mean to be a Christian? Um, and as we know, Kierkegaard uh, posed this question to himself because it concerned his own life, his own existence. But um, he also posed this question to his contemporaries, to the age he was living in. Um, and as far as he could see, uh, for most people, um, this was an easy question with an easy answer. Um, it was supposed that one is um, um, basically born a Christian, that um, one grows up in a Christian family, one's friends are Christians. Um, one lives in a Christian state, as some would uh, consider Denmark to be. Um, so um, it was enough just to go with the crowd and um, there was no doubt about one's Christian identity. The identity was secure, there was no reason to question it, to debate it. Um, so um, Kierkegaard's question um, was in a way a provocation because um, he wanted to stir a controversy about something that was considered uh, completely uncontroversial. So how specifically do you see this as relevant for Socrates? I think that uh, Kierkegaard saw in Socrates uh, a thinker whose uh, philosophy also revolved uh, around uh, a simple question. And again, it was a question that uh, um, was seen as a provocation and uh, 
um, it um, turned into a problem, something that was considered completely unproblematic. Uh, Socrates' question was, um, what does it mean to be a human being? Um, and Kierkegaard notes that in uh, Socrates' time people were perfectly sure of being human and of knowing what does it mean to uh, be a, a human being. Um, but strangely enough, Socrates doubted that one is uh, human simply by birth. Uh, instead, he argued that uh, we need to um, learn to be human, we need to learn what it means to be um, humans. And um, he considered this to be no easy task. He uh, argued that um, every individual is faced with, uh, with um, um, a task, with, uh, with this question, and has to answer it uh, with, his own with his or her own existence. Um, so the question was addressed to the, to the individual. Um, the collective could not answer for the individual. Um, the individual could not inherit the answer from the collective or delegate it to the collective. And I think that in this, um, Socrates was a source of inspiration for Kierkegaard because also the, the question, what does it mean to be a Christian, is um, addressed to the single individual. And the individual um, cannot inherit the, the answer from the collective or delegate it to the collective. He must answer it with his um, or her own existence. So the answer can only come in the form of an existential transformation of the single individual. Uh, so what special and unique message do you think Kierkegaard as a Christian writer has for us today in a pluralistic society? I would like to um, highlight two aspects um, of Kierkegaard as a Christian writer. Um, I think these two aspects are in a creative tension. The first um, aspect is that uh, Kierkegaard is really a thinker um, who goes ad fontes, he goes to the sources, to the sources of Christianity in this case. And that means, first and foremost, um, exploring the Bible. And so when we read Kierkegaard, we see that he's a, he's a thinker who is an avid reader of the Bible. He's a very attentive um, reader. He has a great imagination. And uh, he reads the Bible in a very um, creative way. So he plunges into the psychology of the biblical figures and explores their inner struggles. He invents alternatives to biblical stories and lets the reader compare them to the um, original. He plays for a long time with one sentence and analyzing um, each of its words and their potential meanings. So um, as readers, we are, um, we are often surprised how much we discover um, through Kierkegaard's interpretations um, of the Bible. And the second aspect which I would like to um, um, highlight is that uh, Kierkegaard um, always brings the Bible into a, into a productive um, dialogue with uh, non-Christian sources. And so what example can you give for how Kierkegaard brings the Bible uh, into a dialogue with other sources? Mm. I think there are many examples of this in his um, works, uh, um, both the published works and in, and in his um, journals and papers, but um, I would like to mention one example, um, which is the pseudonymous work um, Fear and Trembling. Um, as we know, um, in Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard plays or elaborates on the biblical motif of uh, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, which is a story taken from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. But interestingly enough, he does not, um, he does not explore this, or this story with the help of uh, Christian um, sources and Christian authors. Um, in fact, he draws on a relatively broad variety of uh, non-Christian sources. He um, borrows motifs from the Greek poet Homer, from the Greek playwright Sophocles and Euripides. He um, refers to the ancient historians um, Livy and Plutarch, and uh, refers to the ideas of Greek philosophers, such as um, Pythagoras, um, Socrates, Plato, and uh, Aristotle. So I think that um, what we can learn from um, Kierkegaard today is exactly this um, importance of solid knowledge of one's own tradition and its principal sources and um, the bringing of this tradition into productive philosophical dialogue with, uh, with um, 
sources from other traditions. One of the few friends that Kihort had throughout his life was a man named Emil Buzin. He recalled the importance of Kihort's master's thesis for the philosopher's later development, explaining, quote, it was most probably while Kihort was writing the concept of irony that he first gained a clear understanding of what he himself wanted to do and what his abilities were. Buzin seems to suggest that there was something about Kihort's work in this context that helped him to decide to be an author and helped him to find out specifically what kind of an author he wanted to be. What was this? Much evidence supports the claim that it was Socrates who was the key for Kierkegaard. Indeed, all of the points that we've touched on here were important for him in one way or another. Aporia, the Sophists, the Gadfly, the Daimon, Maiudics, and of course, Socrates' irony. In many of the most important works of the authorship, Kierkegaard returns to the figure of Socrates. Socrates is discussed at some length in the philosophical fragments as a form of learning that's contrasted to Christianity. Likewise, reference is made to Socrates in the satirical work Prefaces from 1844. A large section of Kierkegaard's famous book Stages on Life's Way, entitled In Vino Veritas, is modeled on Plato's dialogue The Symposium. Throughout Kierkegaard's edifying discourses, Socrates is referred to indirectly as the simple wise man of old. Socrates also appears in scattered passages of the concluding unscientific postscript. Moreover, he's discussed in connection with the theory of love in Kierkegaard's book, Works of Love. Kierkegaard also has one of his pseudonymous authors invoke Socrates explicitly in The Sickness Unto Death as an alternative to the modern age. Finally, Socrates is mentioned as a kind of model for Kierkegaard in the final issue of the moment, shortly before Kierkegaard's death. Kierkegaard recognized some problems in his own day in 19th century Denmark that were analogous to the problems that confronted the Greeks in 5th century BC. Moreover, human nature being what it is, he recognized many of his own contemporaries in the figures that are portrayed in the dialogues of Plato. Kierkegaard hit upon the idea that what was needed in his own time was a new Socrates. By this, he meant not someone who would come up with a new philosophy or a new doctrine, but rather someone who would disturb and provoke people, someone who would shake them from their complacency. This was the goal that he decided to set for himself. He would become the new Socrates, the Socrates of Copenhagen. Thank you.